Hello and welcome to Behind the Ballot at Your TV's extensive coverage of the 2018 municipal election. I'm York Bellsmith and I will be the moderator for the next hour as we present to you the Coburg Deputy Mayoral Debate. In the Your TV studio we have both candidates, Randy Curtis and Suzanne Sagan, vying for your vote for Deputy Mayor of the Town of Coburg coming up on October 22nd. During the program, candidates will discuss, debate, and give their political platform on various topics and questions put together by your TV staff, volunteers, and by you, the viewers. The rules for the debate are as follows. Before we start a taping, candidates picked a number out of a hat for seating purposes and opening statements. Each candidate will be given up to three minutes for their opening statement. We will then move into the question and answer period. Each candidate will be given up to two minutes. Uh, to answer each question. Once the candidates have answered the question, the floor will be open for three minutes or more of open debate between Suzanne and Randy. The order for answering questions by the candidates will always change, so opening statements will go 1-2, the first question will be 2-1, and then back to 1-2, and so on throughout. Uh, finally, each candidate will be given two minutes at the end for their closing statement. Now that we've explained the rules of the debate, we'll begin with the opening statements from the candidates, and the order for this shall be as follows. Suzanne, you shall go first. Thank you, York and Mark and Linda and Your TV for hosting this debate today with the two candidates for the position of Coburg Deputy Mayor. Four years ago, my husband Jerry Brown and I purchased a home here in Coburg to be closer to our blended family of seven children and six grandchildren. We love living here and together with the many recent residents bring a fresh, energized look at how great things can be done in a com and accomplished in a small town with a new vision. My years of experience in municipal government as a former mayor of Prescott and councillor here in Coburg will benefit you as a taxpayer so your money is spent wisely to make Coburg a better place to live, work, play, invest and retire. I believe in an open, transparent and sustainable Coburg. By voting for Suzanne Sagan as your deputy mayor <coughs> you will elect a proven member of council who is already on the job and has integrity, accountability and experience. Attending a few council meetings once a year, a few times a year is not the same as being at the council table. I also bring over 40 years of community and public service to this job. As a member of the Rotary Club of Coburg, I work along with other dedicated Rotarians to raise funds to give back to the community groups and organizations. My experience has taught me to listen to ideas and concerns, to work towards meaningful and fin financially sound solutions, and most of all, to do the hard work that needs to be done to deliver on the needs of Coburg residents, business owners, seniors, and youth. Municipal government is extremely important for all of us. At this local level, we can build a team of council members who can debate openly, issues such as fiscally responsible budgets, infrastructure, transportation, protection of our children, arts and culture. <clears throat> Improving communications is, is vital. Coburg's Deputy Mayor as Coordinator of General Government Portfolio is trusted along with her council members, hard-earned resources of the ratepayers of this community and we should at all times make evidence-based decisions such as determining a return on investment for the hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on consultants every year. A municipal budget is very different from a business budget. My nine years of experience in municipal government have given me the skills and knowledge <coughs> required to lead council's budget process to produce a fair, responsible budget that meets Colbert's needs. In a large corporation, the owners can change, are in charge of the money in a local government, it is the people who are in charge. I invite you to visit my website at suzannefordeputymayor.ca and have your say on my survey. There are many questions there that will answer questions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Randy, your opening statement. York, I'd like to uh, thank you and Kojiko for putting this event together. It's going to be great for the electorate to listen to both sides of the perspective here and look forward to the debate today. I believe in transparent, open, government, the concerns of all citizens need to be considered when deciding what is best for this town. My three goals are collaboration, innovation, and fiscal integrity. The basis of my campaign are formed by three fundamental qualifications. I was born and raised in this beautiful town. My love for this community is in my blood and it's in my DNA. A 30-year career mostly with multinational corporations responsible for multi-million dollar budgets 
and having the leadership skills to get things done by listening to all sides of an issue, collaborating with the stakeholders, and executing with lightning speed. These skills from the private sector are absolutely transferable to municipal politics. When we're dealing with a $25 million corporation like we have here in the town of Coburg, these budgets are not minor by any means and experience is needed in dealing with dollars of this value in order to make sure that the best decisions are made for the constituencies of this town. I've had experience working in multinational corporations, I've worked uh, in other countries, and I know how to bring multi-million dollar budgets in on time, delivered, and make sure they're fiscally responsible for the citizens of this town. Leadership skills are also important because we require collaboration to get things done. We can't have a dictatorial system whereby decisions are made in a vacuum. We need to pull all stakeholders together and leading a collaborative effort will ensure that the best decisions are made for the citizens of this town. We need to keep taxes affordable for all citizens of Coburg and we need to make sure that special interests aren't dealt with on a one-off basis um, and not having the decisions that are in the best interest of all constituents. <coughs> if elected, I pledge to listen to all sides of an issue and make decisions based on what's in the best interest of citizens as a whole. To publish on the town website the budget with quarterly updates, making sure that everybody understands in a timely and transparent way what the um, expenditures have been and also the source of the income for the capital that's required to manage this town. I'd also like to facilitate um, governance for this town based on leadership, based on the fact that we need to get things done and make sure that we spend capital in an efficient and effective way. Thank you. Thank you both for your opening statements. We will now move on to our first question and Randy, you will answer first. One of the major initiatives for the past council was a Community Improvement Plan, or CIP. Some residents feel that taxpayers' money should not be used to help landlords in downtown Coburg fix up their properties, while others are in favor of the project. Are you for or against CIP? Please explain why. And would you increase or decrease the amount of money being dispersed, and should this program expand outside of the downtown core? Once again, Randy, your first answer. So thank you for the question, York. I, I believe that the CIP program is an effective program in building up the downtown. I mean, what we don't want to have happen is demolition through neglect, where these buildings dissipate because they're not being looked after. The CIP program to date has had an effective return for the stakeholders in Coburg because the money that was invested has also mirrored an investment by the renter or the building owner in the last intake, it was a seven to one relationship. In other words, $134,000 was spent in grants and loans and 950,000 plus was spent in the total, um, allowing for a leverage of seven to one in that expenditure. I would maintain the existing $150,000 annual budget and I believe it's funded by Holtco. Um, and if there is a special project that comes along that requires more resources, that would allow for second and third floor development. I think it could be looked at on a special case basis and maybe additional funds would be put on on that basis. I also believe that we need to limit these funds to protecting the historic downtown base. Therefore, I don't see this program expanding outside of what's deemed to be the downtown. Thank you very much, Randy. Suzanne. Thank you, uh, York. Um, the Community Improvement Plan has been a vital part of uh, downtown regeneration here in Coburg. And it is mirrored through many, many other communities. Um, for three years now, uh, first year we had 50,000 allocated, the second and third year we had 150,000 allocated. And there's about 2,000 in change left in the reserves for the CIP. There has been the, some controversy, as you stated in your question, as to whether or not uh, taxpayers should be funding downtown businesses. At a recent um, uh, conference that I attended, uh, the National BIA Conference, CIPs were discussed and they basically said making a building prettier and um, does not necessarily mean increasing the value of the building or increasing the revenue downtown. So my stand is um, I would look at a three year um, revisit of what has been accomplished, how many, how many new uh, um, uh, sales have, have, if sales have increased, if more people have come in 
And if they can substantiate that this actually has been well spent, I would allocate 150000 again at the current level and continue that for um, the next year of 2019 budget. But also, there has to be a return on investment here because we are using um, money and it is been, uh, there, is a, there is a flow through, but we also have to make sure that this money is well spent and there is return. So I, I would continue what we've spent and but not necessarily until we get the um, the community um, behind it and value for what we have already earned spent thank you thank you very much we'll now open up the floor for a few minutes of open debate if either of you have an issue with what your fellow candidate has said now is your opportunity Sin? no I, I think we're kind of both on the same page on this i think uh, um, CIP uh, grants are, are valuable. There is some leveraging and I think it's important that we, but we, we need to analyze what we've spent the money on. So I don't think it's an ongoing grant that people, homeowners, uh, sorry, businesses can, can uh, count on for, for years to come. I, I do believe that's already being done in the process. I mean the planning department goes through, scrutinizes these projects to a lot of detail. There's uh, post submissions that are required to be done and I believe what we have today actually demonstrates that we are getting good value for money. I mentioned the seven to one leverage in terms of what's being spent in total. And um, unless there's a, an issue that's uncovered that we haven't seen at this point in time, I, I don't think it needs a, a review other than the fact to make sure we continue the intakes at the same level we've been doing. Certainly, yeah, certainly the planning department is working hard at this and the criteria is very strict. But it is, it is still funds that we need to uh, get that return on investment and that rejuvenation. Because if it's just filled, fixing up buildings, it doesn't necessarily mean that more, building, more owners are coming in, more sales are being made, and there's more people buying. So I think we need to have a combination of both. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next question. And Suzanne, you will answer first. The biggest issue that affects the residents of Coburg the most is property taxes. Over the past few years, the norm has been to aim for a 1 to 3 percent annual increase. If you become Deputy Mayor, what plan will you put in place to curb rising property taxes? And do you think residents can continue to afford this annual increase? Once again, Suzanne, you answer first. I don't think residents can continue to afford this increase. Uh, at one time, our tax base here was 15 million. Um, it's now up to 22, 23 million projected for 26 million for in a couple years from now. So I think really we have to look at what happened for the last 10 years. Our population base increased 5% from the 2011 census to the 2016 census, and our our um, Taxes are out of control. The biggest spenders, of course, are um, police, fire, protection services, followed right by public work, uh, sorry, parks and rec. So I think, if anything, we look at where those increases have taken place for the last 10 years, last five years, and we look at what people have asked for and what they've spent, and then we just reinvent the, the wheel, so to speak, and say, okay, this is, this is out of control, and we're taxing uh, these people to death and we need to really look at do we really need this high level of taxing and if we do then why? So there will be evidence based questions asked for every department as they come forward and they usually ask for five or six percent more but this year, uh, sorry 2019, next year they will be asked to, to the big question why do you need it, what are you going to do with it and, and keep it within um, one to two percent increase or or even less I would prefer less but certain things have to be have to be paid for and um, we look at everything but it's it is out of control Randy your answer on taxes okay so l let's unpack the tax question a little bit because uh, protection services of which the police services department represents five million um, is an area where the town does not leverage a, a lot of control because the police services act basically requires that um, we need to accept after some debate what the police services budget is. So there's out of the 25 million we've got essentially 5 million that is somewhat outside of our control. So therefore we need to concentrate on the 20 and I believe that we need to hold taxes. I mean the position that I'm running on is to make taxes affordable for all citizens in Coburg and we need to do that by scrutinizing um, the expense budgets 
And we need to come up with uh, essentially a zero-based budgeting process, which would allow us to start from ground zero and apply all the things that are required to run an individual department. And by doing so, then we can examine what's required and what's not. To start off with a negotiation, uh, as Suzanne mentioned, where you're going to start off at five and negotiate it down to two or zero, let's understand every single dollar in that process. And by budgeting from the ground up on a not an annual basis, but on a, on a, at least on a term basis, then we can determine that all those monies are being spent in the right places. The second part of the equation uh, relates to the reserve account. So we've got uh, on the balance sheet that was published in uh, June of this year, from last year, there's some $10 million set aside in reserve accounts. We need to look at obtaining some of those dollars in terms of a, I'll call it uh, taxpayer benefit and that would be used to help reduce taxes. Thank you very much for your answer. We'll now open up the floor for open debate. Um, with regard to the reserves, I think um, reserves are necessary for a town in case of emergencies, but um, over the years, reserves have been put in areas that um, they um, perhaps aren't necessary uh, there to, to, to do roads, to do sewers, yes. But what, what I've discovered, and the reserves are a lot higher than 10 million, and we need to um, look at where, did it, where it is we need the, this, these funds and really talk to, like for, for the two years I've been on council, I've been trying to get quarterly statements presented to council three weeks after the end of the quarter. And we just now got first and second quarter in September. And that is totally unacceptable, even though we ask, we ask, we ask, and that has to change. We cannot um, run the town, we don't run the town as a council, but we cannot see the full picture unless we see those, those, uh, those quarterly statements. So, so if the reserves accounts are much higher than the 10, 10 million, then on page 26 of the financial statement, uh, are those numbers incorrect? Did the auditors put them together incorrectly? No, the auditors didn't put them correctly in, together, but I asked um, Joanne at the finance office the other day for a complete listing of reserves for the town. It covers capital reserves, it covers um, various departments, and it's closer to 20 million. Are they funded, unfunded? They're just the reserves. They're, well, okay, they're but the there's reserves. funded reserves, there's unfunded reserves. Well, how would you determine which is which, and how do you uh, sort that out in terms of where these dollars are? If, well, in fact, you're saying that the financial statement that was published in June for last year is incorrect. I, uh, what I'm saying is uh, there are areas like Holco and Northam that cover, that those include those reserves. So they basically cover an awful lot of the funds that uh, one-off interest uh, items, for example, if somebody wants a 90000 a one-time only, they usually come out from Holco and Northam. So yes, they are part of those reserves. And uh, that's, that's, what it, that's what Joanne sent me, so that's the amounts that I'm working with. As we've actually just brought up the Northam Industrial Park in March of, yes. of this year, uh, the last mortgage payment of $104,352 was made on the industrial park, meaning that the town will have approximately uh, just over one and a quarter million dollars more to spend each year. In what areas do you feel this money should now be allocated? Please give examples and reasons why these funds should be used for your examples. And Randy, you answer this one first. Okay, so um, first of all, we need to make sure we have a reserve that satisfies the requirement of the Northern Industrial Park. In other words, we need to have a contingency so that if a factory leaves town, we have a, ample resources to fund that out of the reserve account. And then secondly, I think that we need to have part of those funds yield to what I just suggested, which is a shareholder or taxpayer benefit um, in terms of reduced taxes. And, and then and the other element is um, we need to make sure that these reserve accounts, which typically go against capital, we want to run those through um, an enhanced version of the asset management tool that the town's been looking at so we can determine what the priorities are based on the payback to the taxpayers. Northam is an interesting question. Um, I think shortly after um, the, uh, the mortgage was paid off, we were presented with uh, the repair and maintenance to uh, a Northern building. And uh, I think the, the annual costs were like 400,000. So there's always, <laughs> there's always something or someplace to put those funds. And I think that's a discussion the new council needs to have. 
I think it's really important that everybody uh, has a say um, in what where those northern funds are going to be gone and uh, typical of any budget we know that there are some things that are already mandated that perhaps council uh, staff knows but council doesn't know we often know of buildings for example or land that's going to be purchased or sold but we only know that at the you know just before the the deal closes so we need to have the complete picture from staff and then look at what our strategy will be and that will be part of the strategic planning process to take those funds what is left remaining in the next year what hasn't been allocated and then go from there i think it's something that the entire coburg new council will have to be, have to answer well i, I guess the only thing i question is is that if you're looking at a uh, a long-term strategy for the town of Coburg that the next council will probably put through in its first first few months that has nothing to do with the deployment of, of resources I mean you need to identify the projects you're not determining how to divide it up so I'm not really sure how you mix the two um, maybe you, you could explain it. Them, but you can't you can't make arbitrary decisions unless you know the complete picture. Well, I understand that, yeah. but you can also prioritize them based on what the payback is to the citizens of Coburg, of course, and that's really what we need to that's do. That's what everybody needs to do for sure, and that that historically has maybe not always been done, and uh, um, it's been done maybe behind the scenes in a quiet way. But I think the citizens of Coburg need to know what we're doing as a council and and go forward from there. And the only thing I would add to that is we need to publish those so we know what each of these reserve accounts is going to do for a period of time. And also, if there's modifications made because circumstances have changed, then we can identify those. But at least we understand where these reserve accounts are going out in the future. Which is why I've been asking for um, uh, quarterly reports. because and, and any issues flagged that we wouldn't necessarily know of, but those issues have not been flagged. And we need to know that so that we can... Uh, we don't we don't obviously run staff but we need to know at the budget process what the mandate is for staff and what they have to work with for the next few years and that includes northern funding okay we're gonna move on to our, our next question uh, the Coburg trailer park sits on a prime piece of real estate in the town of Coburg should the town keep this property or sell it to a developer if you think the town should keep the ownership of this property should it stay as a campground or should it be utilized for something else Again, if keeping it as a trailer park, some major upgrades are going to have to be done both electrically and with the plumbing systems in the park. Mm -hmm. And who should fit the bill for this work? Suzanne, you start first. The waterfront trailer park is a big issue. It certainly was. I attended every one of the waterfront meetings and the maps where the trailer park is located. There was 50% that were vehemently opposed and the other 50% don't do anything with this trailer park. So it's an issue that captures the emotion, captures the heart of just about everybody that lives here. So in a, a few years ago, there was a uh, process done where they, they um, hired yet another consultant to come up with a, um, a year-round plan to what to do with the trailer park. And the, and the consensus was to build a boutique hotel there. And the outrage was overwhelming, and therefore no boutique hotel will be built. I think um, it is part of Coburg. It's, it's strange that a beautiful waterfront has a trailer park on it. In a lot of communities, they're like stuck somewhere else. But this is part of Coburg, and people love it there. So I think we need to embrace that, and we need to fix it up and charge more. There, there, are, there are lots right there on the waterfront that if, if there is a waiting list and there's, there's a big demand every September for those spots, then charge more for it. Let's, let's make more than the 160000 that we net out of that trailer park to put it back into, into repairs and maintenance and let's make it a real revenue generation. I can't believe I'm using that word because there's a certain member of our, our staff that loves that word, but we need to account for do the dollars that are spent there. Thank you very much. Randy, your thoughts on the trailer park? Well, the trailer park's been around for, for decades. Um, it was donated by uh, a family that ran it uh, um, year, years ago, and I think that we need to maintain that heritage for the town. I do agree that it does need upgrades. Uh, the electrical system, uh, it's a 30 amp service for most of the sites. Uh, most of the motor homes today require 230s or a 50 amp service, so that needs to be done. The pads need to be replaced. I think the washrooms need to be upgraded and the sewage system needs to be handled. But all of that can be paid for out of enhanced revenue if we take the pricing for the trailer park up to market levels. I mean, when you've got people waiting in September 
for to reserve a spot for the following year for the whole season, that would tell me that uh, we're under market in terms of the prices. Therefore, I think we need to get added revenue, upgrades, and make it a jewel of the uh, of the beachfront, and it can be all of those things. We'll open the floor for discussion. Basically. Um I think we agree on this. I think it's it's something that will probably stay there for years to come, uh, but it, it just can't be given away. It's too valuable a resource, and uh, we need to make it, uh, you know, more more expensive if you have to, to to stay there. There's a lot of people in Coburg that stay there for the summer because they've got this waterfront lot. So yes, uh, let's let's look at making it ways that the more than the 160 that it nets out every year and and go for uh, a value for the the waterfront and value for the town as well where does the money come from for, for the upgrades well there is a reserve currently for the trailer park so part of the money can come from that and the balance of it if you've got future revenue stream then we can set up a debenture to pay for those so that those upgrades which I think would be uh, several hundred thousand minimum can be handled through taking out the debenture, paying for it over 10 years, and it comes out of the revenue, added revenue that we're going to generate from the trailer park. It's not a big reserve. Uh, it's 153,000, and that's basically a one-year uh, net revenue. Um, so um, we need to look at, uh, you know, spanning out what kind of um, improvements we can make and whether we make them in year one, two, three, or four, and, uh, and, and basically go from there. We can't do them all at the same time, but also, you know, that, that 153 is going to be spent fairly quickly, so we need to monitor that and keep that at a minimum of 100,000 in reserve and then, and then build on that from operating rent revenues. So the only thing I take debate on that one is, is I think you can put a debenture in to pay for these results so you can upgrade it all at once and take it to market pricing-wise all at once so it's not a migration. We do the right job, get it done right, and pay for it out of a future debenture. I think that's easily done. And it's not that easy if you have uh, several, several demands on a budget. Um, but uh, debenture, uh, you know, well, is, got, a, is a consideration. You've got debentures that uh, looked after the marina. you got debentures that looked after the, uh, uh, the sand uh, upgrades down at the harbor. I mean, there's a bunch of debentures that are done. It's an easy tool, and it's well organized if it's done properly, particularly on an element that's generating annual revenue. Well, we'll see. Do either of you think the money could be taken from the surplus that's going to be coming from the Northam, Northam Industrial Park? I don't think so. I think the trailer park should be self-sufficient, just like the marina should be self-sufficient. I think we need to uh, target some of these areas closely, and uh, it's bad enough the CCC has a deficit of 1.2, 1.3 million, and I think we need to really zero in on where the revenues are coming from. We have so few revenue sources in this town that we need to zero in on and make those sustainable so that we can be have an efficient budget going forward. Well, as I mentioned, prudent business decision would be to take a <coughs> revenue stream that you've already got, do the upgrades, pay through it for a debenture, and then if done at once, you can take the pricing up right away, and that's how it would be done. I would not take Northern Industrial Reserves to fund a project like that. It's not needed. It wouldn't be the astute business decision. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, give you a chance to catch your breath, have a drink of water. We'll be right back with the deputy mayoral debate here on your TV. Welcome back to Behind the Ballot, your TV's extensive coverage of the 2018 municipal election and our Town of Coburg Deputy Mayoral Debate with Suzanne Sagan and Randy Curtis. We're going to move on to our next question, and this one is, is one of the biggest roles or jobs as, as Deputy Mayor, and that is being the Budget Chief. Over the past few years, the budget process has become very streamlined, and some would say that not enough time is given to the residents of Coburg to go over the budget and to offer input into the budget process. And many who do offer input feel they are not being heard or that their opinions don't matter. What plans do you have as the budget chief to try and get more community involvement into the process? And Randy, you answer first. Thank you. Um, I, I think that John Henderson in his last term has made progress on this, but we need to move the, the needle a lot farther. Um, and first of all, in terms of engagement, we need to have stakeholders um, that are involved to come in and listen to their concerns at the same time that staff is coming in and presenting what their needs are. 
and then we need to have clear direction go to staff as to what the expectations are. The only exception to that being the police services budget, which has got less impact by the town itself. Uh, and then when we put the budget together and it's approved by council, then we need to publish the budget. Um, and by publishing the budget, then everybody can understand what the priorities are. There should be enough notes on there that it's self-explanatory. And then the last element is to quarterly update that budget against actual expenditures because the budget is a plan. Anybody that's been around long enough in, in business would understand that you put a plan together and then what you do is you monitor yourself against that plan and you note the exception. So we'd have four quarterly updates which we publish to the website and that allows a lot of input from the, uh, from the constituents to understand exactly where their money's being spent. Thank you, Randy. Suzanne. Great question, uh, York, and um, during my time as mayor, um, we had um, a budget process that involved all the different department heads coming forward and uh, um, presenting to us. Here in Coburg, uh, they do this, but they do it behind closed doors, and by the time council gets the budget, it's it's there's a one day and to John Henderson's uh, credit he did uh, bring it open and we had a full day. It's just um, I believe uh, once I become deputy mayor and budget chief that that process will be an entirely open budget. What happens here in Coburg is the the general government chair which is the budget chief, uh, the deputy mayor, he directs this and then um, the rest of council are, are basically in the dark until this comes forward. So initially we want to hear from the public, we want to hear from people that have a vested interest in Coburg, which is everyone, and bring forward your ideas before staff even starts the process. And this year being an election year, it's going to be a little tricky because last year our budget was, was uh, approved on the 30th of, of January. So um, our, basically the year I got sworn in was uh, 30th of January, last year as well. So we need to, A, have the public involved with presentations that we actually listen to and ask questions of rather than just thank you for your information, go away. So we need to have the pub public first, all of council involved, and the department heads presenting to all of council before we start crunching numbers. And then know going forward what the limit will be or what the percentage we hope to get to will be. Right. Thank and you. We'll now open the floor for further discussion. So, so as the former mayor of Prescott, it was like that. Was it a seven million dollar budget? What was the budget in Prescott? It was about six and a half. Six and a half, and then you take police services out. How much would be left? Yeah, police services were about a million too. Okay, so that's a completely different process than what we have here in Coburg, where you've got essentially twenty million outside of police services, and the process I think needs to be a little more controlled, and um, and direction given. Than, than having your director sort of sit around and have public input on that basis because um, n not everybody's starting from the same ground sheet. I mean... Well, that may be the case. And budgets are budgets, uh, whether it's a small community or a small town like Coburg. The numbers are a little bigger, yes, but the different departments are pretty much the same. The, the wants, the fire chief comes forward, he wants, he wants, he wants a new fire truck, whatever. I think it's important that the town sees what um, these these individual directors we have a lot of directors we have a lot of managers we have deputy directors now and everybody wants to make their department better they want to make it bigger and bigger we need to start bringing that back to control and we need to start saying no once in a while okay so just to break that down you you want the public to come in and comment as to whether they need a new fire truck before you talk to the fire chief is that how that works i want the public to come in present their ideas followed by the directors to give their their um ask i guess and then um following that the uh, the council gets to see it and the public not necessarily asking, but being privy to that in the council chamber so they know what's going on. These budgets are too big to be done behind closed doors. Well, well I agree with that statement, but at the same token, it's pretty big to have a lot of con consumers come up and indicate what their needs are. How are they going to understand what the needs of uh, uh, production mm -hmm. services are? How are they going to need what the needs they, of... They, 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 the consumers will have a few hours at the beginning of the process to explain their wants, 
followed by the directors, and then the consumers can sit and listen, but they will have their say at the beginning. And we will also ask for input, um, sort of a week in between, so we can we can sort of assimilate everything that so, so based it. on your experience in Prescott give me some examples of what the constituents would be asking for well it's always the same lower taxes uh, lower costs and uh, um, basically more value for my money Every, right. so, it doesn't so, matter if it's a small so, community or a big community so, everybody wants so the same. if that is the case then isn't that the direction you need to give the directors so that they come in and deliver a budget based on the expectations of the stakeholders? I, I mean, really, isn't that the process? Well, you can, you know, unlike your corporate world, in a, in a municipality, you can, you can ask. You know, this is like last year, for example. I'll give you an example. Last year, um, John Henderson said, okay, we don't want the budget to be any higher than 1.5. So everyone came in 5, 6, 7, 8. So there's a lot of time wasted bringing that back down to 1.5 because you know, as I do, that you can't go to the public with a tax increase of more than, than one and a half, maybe two, but primarily under two. So you have to look at all your assessment, you look at after your growth, and then factor that all in. But you cannot let staff say, okay, we want this and this and this, and it's going to be an 8% increase. Well, I agree with that, but what you do is you collaborate with the staff. These are the people that have the numbers. They understand what's required and let them come forward and make sure that it's in line with what the public expectation is, which we just agreed is basically minimal happen. or don't. It doesn't happen that way. Well, it certainly happens in, uh, in any corporation because what you've got... That's what I'm saying. This yeah, is not a corporation. But the this process is, can be exactly the same. It cannot because people... If you're telling me that the process you have now is broken, maybe we no, need to try a new way to do it. All I'm saying is staff eventually makes it down to the 1.5 or the 1.7 whatever the budget chief determines but it takes a lot of time to get in there because they all have their special needs and well, wants it doesn't matter where you are a 25 million dollar budget takes a lot of time well sure it does sure it does but okay, it's we're gonna, we're gonna move on okay to, to our next question uh, we're going to talk about homelessness over the past couple of years homelessness is becoming very visible on the streets of Coburg do you think this is a municipal issue if so, what could be done to help these individuals at the municipal level? If you do not think it is a municipal issue, how would you lobby or work with other levels of government to help these individuals that are in need? And Suzanne, you answer first. Well, it is a big issue, and cer certainly affordable housing, rent geared to income housing is, is a big issue. I spent uh, uh, several hours with uh, the uh, chair of the uh, housing in the counties, and basically how it works is the government gives the counties as the service provider the funds to either build affordable housing or find homes like transition house temporary uh, homes for uh, homeless people and the municipal issue the, there is ways but it's very very limited we cannot bonus we cannot add anything we can build that into our our strategic plan but it's not historically part of a municipal uh, budget but I think now we have we've been we have an affordable housing um, debate coming up Thursday morning, and it's become some, such an issue that we have to look at innovative ways to make this doable somehow. And I asked Rebecca the other day at the counties, and I said, "So, are there any more? Uh, is there any more money coming from the province for for more bills, for more places for these people to go?" And there is absolutely nothing coming forward. So. Uh, if, in order for us, we're not normally in that business, but in us, in order for us to, to make that possible, we have to look at all of our resources, and whether it's co-op housing, whether it's it's uh, uh, giving incentives such as they are, because incentives usually only fall under the CIP for uh, business uh, basement renovations or garage renovations, but it's it's pretty limited as to what we can offer. Okay, thank you, Randy, on homelessness. Well, it, certainly, it, it's a very important issue, and, and it's tied in with other issues such as mental health and so forth, and this is a huge problem which has developed in this town over the last three or four years, uh, particularly over the last three or four years. So the, the town has limited responsibility o o over this issue. As the county is responsible for uh, maintaining and providing low-income housing. I take some exception to the comment about the no money from the Ontario government when the federal government announced uh, a year ago that they're going to put 40 billion into low-income housing and affordable housing. What we need to do is collaborate with the county, 
Maybe we need to do an inventory of vacant lands that we have available and turn that over to the county so that we can make sure, sure that we get more than our fair share of that $40 billion. And I think that that's what we need to work on. The other part that I think is in our jurisdiction to do is that I think that we need some sort of shelter. As I understand it today, we've got people that spend overnight in the, in the, in the police station and then in the morning they're out on the benches on the street. And we, we need to have some facility that I think the town has to work on for these poor souls and, and allow them you know, some way to get back into the, the mainstream of the community and help them along. And I think it's within our purview to do that. We'll open the floor for further discussion. Well, last night at Council, for example, Habitat for Humanity came to Council and uh, they are going to add two units to an existing home on uh, University Avenue, 2224 University Avenue. Good discussion, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, support it was unanimous support at council and I think those issues because it's it's basically site plans and support from council that comes to us and in order for us to to spend uh, dollars that really don't belong to us but belong to the people of Coburg we pretty much have to you know g have a group meeting have a town hall meeting and say is this issue that important to you that we take 100,000, 200,000 of our reserves, wherever the money comes from? Because we all know the housing prices today. We all know that it takes at least 400 grand just to buy a small bungalow. So we need to decide we're, if this is something that we want to do on a, on a short-term basis, long-term basis, then we need to do it. But boy, I tell you, it's, it, it will get pushed back unless we get support from the rest of the community. Well, just to finish that up, I, I do believe there is support from the community and, and I do believe that we can collaborate with the county and look at vacant pieces of property that we have to help contribute to that. And I, I think it's, this is a sad situation for these poor souls and, and we need to do everything that we can do to help them. And again, it's outside of our jurisdiction, but we can collaborate with the county and we can do a much better job. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question and this has to do with the West Harbor. Uh, we'd like you to state your stance on the West Harbor. Are you in favor or against expansion of the marina into this area? And would you be in favor of passing a motion to put a halt to any further discussions during the next term of council? And finally, does the marina need to purchase a boat lift to provide a safer way to remove boats from the harbor? If so, who should pay for the lift? And Randy, you're first. Okay. So um, let me just explain expansion and revenue expansion because I think there's a misnomer here. Um, I believe, and, and, and I, I sincerely, that we could increase revenues from the marina by expanding what we do without adding any boat slips west of the center pier. I mean, I mean that's completely doable. We've got a situation where 38% of the boat slips are dedicated to transient boaters. Uh, we can reduce that number down to industry standard like 10 and, uh, not, um, and, and enhance revenues. I think there's other services that we can provide and we can do that with keeping the pristine view from the uh, west side of the center pier without any difficulty. Do we need a motion at council to do that? I, I, I don't think that that's required, but if there is a motion, I would certainly support that. And the reason I say that is, if you look at the master waterfront plan, there isn't anything in there for another eight years re around this particular project. Um, I'm not sure what a motion does other than give people on council a comfort level because it's really not doing anything. It's the project to move forward and that's when it comes to, to enhancing those revenues that that decision would be made. The boat lift issue is another, um, needs a lot more work. Uh, first of all, I'm talked to some experts and the $850,000 number that was kicked around in the waterfront master plan is extremely on the high side, but before anyone can consider a, a boat lift, what we need to do is have boat storage so that we can increase the revenues by having such a mechanism. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done before any consideration would be given to a boat lift. Thank you very much. Suzanne, West Harbor. Thank you, uh, York. Um, <clears throat> West Harbor is one of the first places we visited when we were thinking of buying a home here. And uh, um, I'm already on, on record as saying that uh, um, first couple months of this new term, I will be putting a notice of motion forward to 
uh, cancel any plans for any expansion of the um, harbor, the West Harbor. And yes, it is number seven on, these, on this uh, waterfront plan, but it is just a work in progress and any, any part of that plan, for example, the renovations on the East Pier are number one, but any part of that plan can be moved forward at any time if there's, if there's uh, enough need around council, if enough desire. So by, by basically putting that motion forward, it's more than a comfort level. It's, it's responding to what the people have spoken to twice to not have any of that expansion. Um, on the, um, and I agree that we need to have a better way of sustainability. Uh, Brockville, City of Brockville, 23,000 people, they have 90 slips. And they put forward a motion just a few weeks ago to add to those slips, and it was shot down because um, we have 216 slips, 69 of those are transient. So um, we have a, a waiting list of people that want to have a slip, that want to have a seasonal slip. Let's maximize that, let's bring it down to a few and measure how much, how much transient is actually doing. With regard to the boat lift, um, there's 350,000 in the reserve right now at the uh, marina and 850,000 seems to be the number. It may be high, it may be low. Um, that is something the, the harbor should pay for out of their reserves, out of their money, out of their operating capital and not put it on the backs of the taxpayers for approximately 50 boaters that may or may not need it. We'll now open the floor for further discussion. So uh, let's just talk about this uh, motion that you would like to put forward. So you'd put a motion through so there'd be no discussion on this subject as opposed to if, if, if uh, staff came in the third year with a plan to do something um, they, they wouldn't be able to do that or I'm just not sure what the motion does other than reconfirm your commitment to um, what the position is on, on slips west of the center pier which is the same as mine. The motion basically says there is no expansion of the of the West Harbor in the four years that we are a council. We can't decide down the road, we can't change for other councils, but for our council, no expansion during our term. My goal um, would be to have it made uh, as, a, as a natural reserve and uh, we'll work toward that. So there will never be an expansion of the West Harbor. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question. Uh, having an open dialogue with the residents of the community and keeping them informed on how decisions are made in the municipality is a key to a successful council. People in the town of Coburg say that currently this does not occur. How will you keep the lines of communication open when it comes to the decisions of council? Also, how will you increase the openness of the decision-making process without crossing the line of releasing information that needs to be kept private by law? Suzanne, you're first. In the two years I've been on Coburg Council, um, we get a lot of emails, we get a lot of phone calls, and uh, uh, basically what I get when I get an email or a phone call is I don't know where else to turn because nobody's listening to me. So what my vision here is to um, talk to people, bring them in, have a couple of public meetings a year, um, and the Q&A after uh, committee meetings or after uh, council meetings has been tossed around and sometimes special groups can take over those but we, we, if we can put it on agenda based items uh, for committee of the whole not council because most of the discussion happens at the committee of the whole and let's have a let's let's listen to people I've been on that that council and people come and they present and they pour their hearts out especially over the waterfront we had 13 delegations in one night against approval of the waterfront plan and it still got approved so um, I asked for it to just be accepted for information purposes because it was so fluid so we have to learn how to listen and we have to l hear what people are saying and um, the only way we can really do that is to have a, a Q&A after committee of the whole and and really on agenda related items and then twice a year have a town hall meeting so that people, really good moderator would be needed, but have, have town hall meetings because if you don't listen to people, they get angrier and angrier and then it all kind of blows. If you listen to them quietly, then the issue is not as, as strong uh, and people feel that they've been heard. Randy. Well, I think Suzanne and I are in agreement. I mean, to have question and answer period at the committee of the whole, uh, allows an opportunity for someone to get back and answer that question because you don't want to be in a situation where you're making a decision 
and not have, have, a, uh, have a question come in and not be able to provide the answer or understand the question. So Committee of the Whole works perfectly for a Q&A. I did speak out uh, with um, a councillor in Port Hope. They have a Q&A uh, session. Um, they indicated that it works reasonably well. It's well directed by the, by the chair. Um, and then secondly, um, uh, they, they do have a few people that get up grandstanding with the same issues all over again, and that sort of needs to be regulated. Uh, but a, a good person sort of moderating this would allow that open dialogue. And again, that provides council with more input to make decisions at the final process at the council meetings. Um, when we're into a situation, whether it's semi-annual or quarterly, I think we're saying the same thing because I believe in sort of this hybrid where quarterly there would be more of a town hall meeting for issues that aren't necessarily on the agenda that can be brought up. Something like a you know, stoplight on a certain intersection or something that's bothering certain citizens and they need a venue to, uh, to bring that public. I, I think that that's a good opportunity. I do believe there's some legislative issues that need to be done in order to make that happen. I don't think it's just as easy as saying that you want to do one, but uh, I think it's quite workable and I would certainly support that. We are just about out of time, but I do want to, the, the number of the candidates that are running for council, this is a, an issue for them that they're going to bring forth. So you know the council is going to be dealing this, with this. How would you as Deputy Mayor uh, deal with the new councillors that are coming on that want this change? So, you, so you're saying new councillors It's, it's going to come up in council this year. Sure. All right. So I, I think we're saying that, I think we're both saying the same thing, that we would support that. Um, allowing for this period through the Committee of the Whole to ask the questions that may not be answered until midweek or long before the Council comes to meeting on the final legislative process of it okay. and to have this open dialogue uh, essentially uh, once a quarter whether it's twice a year I mean I mean that's a yeah that, that's, that's <coughs> a I couple think, of seconds I think yeah. yes um, um, put it on the floor have the discussion and my, my view, because of these special interest groups, let's make it a trial period for six months. Right. Let's, let's make that part of the motion. We try it for six months. If there's respect, if there's, uh, you know, if everyone is, is okay, we respecting it, we we're good. Have, we do have to wrap yeah. it up. Uh, so that does wrap up the question and answer okay. period already. We're now going to hear closing statements uh, from our candidates. I want to remind the candidates that you have up to two minutes for your final statements, and we start with Randy. Okay. Well, 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 thank you, York. Um, so I just want to reiterate that, that I truly believe that a 30 years of business experience working with multi-million dollar budgets is transferable to the public sector. I know my um, competitor here disagrees with me on that front, but I really think if you look at it, okay, you've got people like John Tory, the mayor. I mean, he's a business experience working for Rogers. This is not something that you can create in a vacuum. You need this experience to be able to handle these multi-million dollar budgets. And if I am elected mayor, I would, ag or deputy mayor, I'm so sorry, I would agree that what we need to do is to publicly disclose the budget. We need to monitor the budget so it's upgraded uh, and presented to the citizens on a quarterly basis. And we need to take all these reserve accounts, whether it's 10 million as per the financial statement or 20 million as per Suzanne and make sure we understand completely where these monies are going to be spent and if the plan changes the following year then we adjust the plan so everybody's in full agreement and understanding and I pledge to make those commitments happen. Thank you very much and Suzanne your final statement. Just to clarify um, the reserve funds that we're obligated to are 11 million four and the discretionary funds are 9.9 .9 million, so that's a total of 21. <clears throat> Since my appointment to uh, Colbert Council in January 2017, winning this seat against uh, the individual on my right, um, along with 10 other people, I've talked to a lot of people here in Colbert, and I've listened, and it's my job, that's what it is. The job as a municipal councillor is to listen to the people of, of the town that they represent, and, and do something about it. My attendance record and voting record prove that I have been there for you as a councillor and will do so as your deputy mayor for the next four years. With this experience in municipal government, community involvement, financial management, community, communication skills, I can continue to be a strong voice. I just wanted to add as well in my closing statements that women account for 54% of Coburg's population. So it's great to see four women running for council this October, and it is time to elect a gender-based, balanced uh, council in 2018. 
Our new council will prepare the financial statements. We'll be looking at the asset management plan. We will look at uh, the master culture plan, repair the East Pier, and update the zoning bylaw. And that's just the beginning. Um, <clears throat> we do disagree on whether this, these skills can be transferred. Do you really want to risk a 22 million plus million budget to someone with no municipal experience? Your vote will help me to squeeze out every value of every dollar, reduce expenses, and uh, while working with the municipal. Uh, Cobra can unlock its tremendous potential. I ask for your vote on October the 18th and, uh, sorry, October the 22nd, 2018, and thank you. I want to thank you both, Suzanne Sagan and Randy Curtis, for coming into the Your TV studio and participating in this deputy mayoral debate. And thank you for putting yourselves out there to represent the citizens in the town of Coburg. Voting begins on October the 15th at 10 a.m. and runs right up until 8 p.m. on Election Day, which is October 22nd. The town of Coburg will have two voter help centers set up. They'll be located in the Victoria Hall courtroom and at the library. From October 15th to 19th, they will operate from 10 a.m. till 4.30 p.m. and on Election Day from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. You've been watching Behind the Ballot, your TV's extensive coverage of the 2018 municipal election. I'm York Bellsmith, and thank you very much for watching.